Well, good afternoon. Um, I want to make time here at the beginning for any questions um, that have come to mind that you would like to raise that we could discuss. I also, uh, looking ahead uh, for today, would like to um, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, restorative justice, um, not as an alternative to justice, but as an alternative form of justice, and um, look at as well at the uh, uh, Moral Education Theory of Punishment by Gene Hampton, um, which is again providing a different kind of perspective. And then we can, I think, perhaps talk about the, the issue of forgiveness and um, uh, the, the claim of Aristotle that forgiveness is a part of justice, that justice um, is not distinct from forgiveness, but is a part of it. Um, and it raises some interesting questions having to do with the state. Um, is it possible for the state, for the government, to um, be engaged in forgiveness? Or is that something that has to take place at a different level? So, so I, that, that's kind of um, what the day looks like to me, and we can, um, we can go wherever you would like to go. I do want to begin, though, by, by asking if there are questions from either something that happened yesterday or as you read things about class today and you're afraid we won't get to your question, um, maybe you'd like to ask that now and we could, we could talk about that now. Is there anything? Please, Daniel. Professor, in your article, you show us a version of a natural law as a model, guidelines to think about the moral dilemmas. Mm -hmm. If I understood right, this model was found into the legal practice in a common moral agreement. Mm -hmm. So, if there, there is a common moral agreement into the legal system, can we say that moral evaluate or moral considerations are necessary conditions, even though not sufficient for the criminal justice system? Hmm. Well, <laughs> is, is it a, a necessary, is, okay, is the, um, is the, is the moral attitude a necessary condition for the legal, um, the criminal justice system? Does, does it find its way into law necessarily? I, um, I, just thinking about this right now, I, I, I think the answer to that would be yes, um, in, in this respect, that um, um, the, the, the moral notions that we're talking about are moral norms. They are accepted as such in the moral community. And because they are norms, we know when something fails to meet the norm. So an offense, um, a moral offense, is failing to meet the norm. And um, it doesn't, you know, I could be rude to you. Um, we're walking out the door together and I just push my way in front of you and it's rude. And that's violating some norms in the society because we should not be rude to one another. That's not something that we want to put into the law. Okay, there are things that just don't get into the law. But there are serious things that get into the law that do reflect moral norms. We shouldn't steal from one another. We shouldn't kill one another, you know, th all those things. So around those big things, I think the answer to this is yes, that um, they're reflecting the moral norms. And as we were saying at the end yesterday, um, those moral norms may themselves be in need of further growth and evolution at any given moment in a, in a society. Um, 
a society affirms certain norms within the conditions of its understanding of reality and, um, and, and all, all sorts of things come into play there. Um, um, and I think it finds its, its, its way into law. I think they do. So it's not only that, um, uh, say, in the United States in the 1850s, that we had an immoral practice, slavery, that went on, but we also had that immoral practice enshrined in law, um, in state laws, and in the Constitution of the United States, in the very founding document of, of, the, of the country. Um, and it changed. The, um, you know, there's a whole history as to how that happened, but it, it changed. So um, the law caught up um, with a moral change that had, had taken place. And it didn't, it didn't, not everybody caught up with it, okay? But, but um, I do think that there is a sense in which we want to say that, that law is incorporating um, moral norms. The moral norms themselves may be flawed. Um, they are not as advanced. They are not as broad. They are not as sensitive. They are not as informed as they should be. Um, uh, and again, I, again, we talked about this yesterday, but, but I, I think the, the debate that has gone on about same-sex marriage and things like that are, are reflecting some of those, those things. Um, that there are different attitudes developing within a moral community. And what's, what's kind of amazing um, in the American experience around um, homosexuality, what's amazing about that is how quickly that has changed. Um, changes about attitudes like that take decades and decades and decades. And this change came about within five or six years. Okay? And part of it is just because young people going to university and things just do not share the, the viewpoints of their elders. And they know gay people, they're not frightened by gay people, and they don't want to see friends of theirs who are gay hurt and things like that. And a lot of energy for this came from um, um, just the experience of people encountering other people. And it, so the, the moral norms change, okay? They are, they are subject to um, evolution, they are probably subject to devolution, too. Um, you know, that, that's another thing that has to be said. Um, when you take an historical example like um, uh, Hitler's Germany, um, the, the, the falling into, um, or, or the, the breaking of the barriers that had kept anti-Semitism in check for so long, um, at least reasonably in check, it wasn't perfect by any stretch, but but um, Hitler and uh, his regime just uh, took the fences down completely. So that was sort of a devolution into um, um, genetic supremacy for, the, for the, um, the, the Nordic race, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, so it's, so the, point, the point is that those things can happen. So um, I think the answer to your, your question is yes. Um, but it's qualified only in the sense that the, the, the moral norms um, can themselves be deficient. And that, can, that deficiency can often be seen in law, and in order to change the moral norms, um, sometimes the point of attack is the law rather than the moral norm. You're trying to get at the moral norm. The, so that's why Martin Luther King um, focused in on legislative change. If we can change the law, we'll hope that people come along with it. But the law has to go out in front of the people because we're not just going to go into the southern states and change people's viewpoints. But if we change the law, all kinds of things will happen because of that. So there are dynamics between the two that are in play. Well, this is your area of, of research, so you know a lot more about this kind of thing than I do. Um, but 
I mean, do you do you agree with that? Do you, that there's that kind of relationship from? Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Hello. Any anybody else have a a question, a concern, a comment, an answer that you'd like to share? Okay. Well, if not, um, maybe what we'll do, and uh, some of these things can come up in our discussions. I thought maybe we would take a look at um, uh, this one article that you had by Albert Zur, or Dzur, D-Z-U-R, on uh, restorative justice and civic accountability for punishment. Um, I was um, looking for what I hoped would be a... Um, a philosophically tough-minded article on restorative justice, and I, I, I thought this was one. I, I thought this was a very sophisticated article. I mean, that's how I read it, and um, I, I thought maybe um, this this would help us to get in some of the um, the issues that we we want to get into. Um, so, um, part of what um, Zur, yeah, I don't quite know how to pronounce his name. Um, he's, he's focusing um, on restorative justice. That's a piece of it, and we can talk about that. But he's also talking about civic responsibility. So what do you think he means by civic responsibility? Anybody? Oh. Yes, I, I think that's right. It it is um, an attempt to uh, uh, to think about responsibility in the context of of um, shared shared um, citizenship, and, and we've seen this before. It's the idea of accepting the offender as one of us, not to see the offender as somebody outside the moral community, but somebody inside the moral community who has um, uh, per perhaps fa failed to live up to our um, expectations for, for appropriate behavior, that, that, that kind of thing. So um, part of the issue here is that offenders um, who fail to meet the norms um, of society um, need to have that addressed as, as an offender because, we, we, again, if we're thinking about you know, um, just punishment or something like that, because the end in view is to create this harmony um, that was lost by the offense to recreate a value equilibrium where things are connecting here. Um, so uh, um, civic accountability, the, fo the focus here is that um, um, it, it's, it's, it's not just the offender who's going to be receiving something from the community, if you will, but the community um, has to accept responsibility for holding the person accountable and holding itself accountable. Um, the, the civic community itself has to be accountable um, in, in the process of, of restoring that equilibrium. So that's, that's part of what um, is going on in this. Um, uh, the, the idea is that um, restorative justice attempts to make an inherently coercive process, um, that's the punishment piece of things, um, more con consensual, transparent, constructive, and communicative. Okay, so um, um, the, this is a, a picture that's di directed towards democracies 
and, um, and making democracies more uh, uh, accountable in terms of um, um, bringing, um, bringing peace and harmony back into the, the body politic, if you will. So it's a focus on um, um, resolving conflict, and, but also on restoring the offender and having the uh, moral community be accountable for its role in that. And that leads to restorative justice because restorative justice um, um, proceeds by means of uh, methods and procedures that involve the community. Okay, um, so what kinds of things, what kinds of um, things does restorative justice emphasize? You think? Is it? Let me let me ask you. This, do you think? Do you after thinking about this and reading some of this? Do, do you think restorative justice is coercive in some way? You think it is? I don't think that's ever good, punishing a person, but for the society, it is good. So thinking only in the person and their pain, the person who did something wrong mm -hmm. and their pain, it is perfect because we're making them pay and I don't think we should have this right, but as the other, as the other hand, if we don't have the right, they keep doing bad things and there's no punishment, and so I, I think we keep both sides. Yeah, you've got a lot of opinions there. A lot of opinions running, running through that, and um, I would like to come back to one of them that, um, before we get to the rights thing at the end. Um, but you said something like you don't believe there should be punishment. Just in, in, in general, is that right? No, no, I mean, I, I don't think uh, someone has the right to hurt another person, even to punish them. I think that's wrong, but it's necessary, but also wrong. Well, I, I don't know, maybe what? I'm new in philosophy, so I can be wrong. <laughs> well, no, I'm just, in, I'm interested in that, um, that um, you would say that it's wrong, but it may be necessary. Um, how, how do you put those two things together? Um, Morally wrong, because... Well, that's getting back to the, the yeah. issue that we, we started out with, though. Um, because if it's... If, if something is wrong... Um, uh, um, how, do, how is the community supposed to be dealing with, with that issue? And if you're using coercion... Uh, you know, you're, you're making a fine moral claim there that um, um, to, to inflict pain on somebody is, is wrong, whether it's done by an offender um, affecting a victim or whether it's being done by the state, we'll just call it the state, um, doing it uh, to that offender as part of a punishment sanctioned in law and by society and by the, the norms. But... Um, um, it's one thing to say that that infliction of pain is wrong. It's another thing to say that it's necessary. Um, it's like the necessary, um, the word necessary is um, more important than the idea that it's wrong. I mean, we're not supposed to do stuff that's wrong, right? Right? Okay. Okay. So... I guess you all. There is an ambiguity, I think. I say that say it again? That it is dual. Okay. There is some ambiguity. Both sides. It is uh, it is necessary. More than it is wrong, probably, but also cannot stop being wrong only because the state is doing it. 
And uh, we, I don't know, I think uh, with your talk uh, about your country, I keep thinking with myself in mind, and I, I st start to remember people who go to the jail and get there like 20 years for nothing, and they go to the world, and the court didn't get anything. Even though what they did is morally wrong, there is no one to supervision them. It is, it is complicated, I think. So when I read, I see it is necessary, but also I see that like here, thinking in the reality, it didn't work like supposed to. Well, let me ask you this. Do you, do you think that um, restorative justice as we've had it presented here, does provide um, an alternative punishment that isn't wrong, that satisfies the need for necessary, a necessary response to wrongdoing, but it's a response that is not wrong. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Now, there was something said in this, this article that I think is interesting, and it was that People who go through the restorative justice, you're an offender, and you go through the process. And again, this process can be opened up. I mean, it, it, it typically is opened up by the courts. Okay, the courts will say, let's see if we can figure this issue, this conflict out, and see if we can get to a resolution without um, going to a jury trial or a judge's decision that's going to lead to legal penalties that may put a person in jail. Um, so you're actually trying to avoid that, right? So, um, um, so we set up this alternative process and it's a, a mediation process. It's where the victim and the offender um, actually sit down at a table together with a mediator and they have conversation, right, about this. And, and we can talk more about the details of that. Um, but they, they, they try to work this out as an alternative. In this article, there was something interesting said, which is that um, a lot of the people who are offenders who sit down in restorative justice processes in, in, in at, the, at the table, wind up feeling that it was coercive. Okay. Now, why why do you think they would feel that? Well, any of the rest of you have a thought about that? Why would they feel it was coercive? <laughs> you know, if if one of the objectives um, of punishment is to make a person aware of the wrongdoing. And it could be, you know, the Hampton article we read talks about this, that there's an education process that punishment is supposed to, um, um, you can still call it punishment, but when we fill in the details, the details tell us that the punishment is an education process, all right? Um, and again, you don't have to agree with this, but this is what's being put forward. So if it's an education process, what are you supposed to learn? You're supposed to learn that you did something wrong, that um, you may have offended and harmed somebody unaware that what you did was wrong. You thought you had a right to do something, whatever. You tell yourself that you did something that was justifiable. Um, so that if you don't get to the point where you are able to admit that what you did was wrong, and you can't tell that to another person, or you feel like the situation, the restorative justice situation, is forcing you to admit to the person you harm, yeah, I hurt you, I'm really sorry about that. Um, there could be a sincerity issue in that, but a person could feel coerced into um, um, saying they're sorry, um, they wanna make restitution and all of that when maybe they don't. 
So the, they know what the situation is. They do want to avoid jail. They don't want to go to prison, and they're, they've been told this is a way to do it. So they participate in the process. Um, what I'm trying to figure out is why somebody going through that process would think it was coercive. When ideally, if an offender sits down with a victim and they talk this thing through, um, it should be relieving of guilt and, and blame. Um, there could potentially be some forgiveness that comes out of this. And we've recreated that, that social harmony and that um, uh, value equilibrium that we had wanted. Okay, so it's a means to do that. Are any re any reactions to that? Does that? Um, I don't know if that just it was was a weird thing that struck out to me, but it, it it did. That that people who are the perpetrators, the offenders, the wrongdoers, who get engaged in the in the process, will often experience that process as coercive. They feel like they're being put under pressure to do something. And they know what it is they're supposed to do. I can be wrong with that, but uh, it may be something like uh, they have their own time to feel the guilt. Maybe uh, with the government and all the court interfering in their process, He's not going to feel it because the guilt, uh, as I see right. here, uh, is a very important part to the process of redemption and start again in the moral society. So if he didn't feel the guilt, he's not going to, to understand and then this is coercion because he didn't, didn't understand that what he did is wrong, more oh. wrong. Yeah. So that would speak to a, a failure of the punishment being an education process, right? Wouldn't it? Yeah. So that's part of the issue here is whether, in fact, what restorative justice requires is the idea that the offender is going to recognize um, and become aware of the guilt that they have and, and the fact that what they did was morally wrong and live with that, okay? And um, rather than receiving the, the pain of imprisonment or something, they are going to go through the pain of, of guilt and go through this um, mediation process to, to try to figure out how can we restore justice here? What is required to do? Um, so I need restitution. I need to I need to give back to you the money I stole. Um, but more than that, I there's something else that needs to come to, um, which then becomes part of the of the punishment um, side of things. So, okay, all right. Um, yeah, I think that's on on that was on the page seven of this thing. The, um, yeah, there was just this little sentence here. For, Studies of offenders and victims taking part in restorative justice programs in Australia and New Zealand show that it feels like punishment to the respondents who experience the program. It does more justice to both the movement and the theory to say that restorative justice is a democratic theory of punishment that emphasizes accountability on all sides. So, um, yeah, and he goes through, um, um, he or she, I don't know, Albert, yeah. Um, this author, um, he, he talks about restorative justice like retributive theories, wants to censure the offender for past behavior. So there is blaming that goes on. Um, and wants sanctions to be proportionate to the offense, so there's a proportionality piece of this. Um, and like rehabilitative theories, it considers what can be done to curb future offending behavior. So there's attention to the future. Um, 
you know, which brings into account some utilitarian concerns. So you've got some utilitarian things, you've got some retributive things, but it's, um, um, uh, the, the, it says here, this is on page six, the major difference is how traditional procedures and values are modified by restorative justice, how they are devolved and taken up by those most affected by the criminal offense. Um, see, part of this is, is, I think, paying attention to the victim of crime and saying that victims of crime want certain things and um, they're not necessarily uh, vindictive or vengeful kinds of things. Um, so um, the idea is um, that victims are central to the process. The focus is on repairing the harm between the victim and offender and between the offender and the community. The community members or organizations take a more active role. The process is characterized by dialogue and negotiation among the partners. So the outcomes of the restorative justice process are not figured out at the front end. It's not like there is a sentence of 20 years that's given it's like um, we're going to sit down, and have a conversation, and we're going to pay attention to what the victim says and, um, and pay attention to what the victim needs out of this encounter with the offender. Um, if you had a chance to read that article, um, what was the name of it? Um, it was about um, a feminism, rape, and the search for justice. Very interesting article. Um, because, and we talked about it a little bit yesterday, but, but it was the idea that um, uh, women who have suffered um, rape, sexual violence, want something out of the punishment. They want the offender, um, I should find that for you, because I, I was looking at this and I was just struck by how much this looks like what has just gone on in the United States around a Supreme Court accusation. We had a um, Brett Kavanaugh, the candidate for the Supreme Court, um, who's now on the court. Um, let me see if I can find this real quick. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah. Yeah. So this is on. This is from the um, the article on um, uh, rape, uh, feminism, rape, and the search for justice. And there's some criticism of feminism in this. But 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 listen to this. In her interviews with victims of domestic and sexual violence, Judith Herman found that punishment, as traditionally conceived and practiced by the criminal justice system, was not a key priority for victims. If you're the victim of rape or sexual abuse, sexual violence, um, just running you through the criminal justice system is not what the victim wants, okay? That's what we have set up, okay? This is the part, this is the part that reminded me of the, um, the woman, Dr. Ford, who went before Congress and the TV cameras, and we were just all watching this, um, the goal most commonly sought was exposure of the offender as an offender. That's what she was doing. A man was getting ready to be appointed to the Supreme Court of our country, and this woman came forward to say, when I was in, in high school, he sexually assaulted me. The goal most commonly sought was exposure of the offender as the offender. That's what's wanted. It was more important to deprive the perpetrator of undeserved honor and status than to deprive them of either liberty or fortune. Um, Dr. Ford said a few days after Kavanaugh was sworn onto the court that she was not supporting any effort to impeach him. She was not wanting retaliation on him that he's gonna pay for the rest of his life for something he did as a 17-year-old kid. 
Um, it was more important to deprive the perpetrator of undeserved honor and status. That's what she wanted. Is this the, and she wasn't saying that she's got the answer to this. The decision making for whether this man sits on the Supreme Court or not belonged with the, the senator sitting around. She's saying, that's your, she said, that's your decision to make, but I want you to know what he did, okay? Um, furthermore, victims sought validation from the community by denunciation of the crime, which transferred the burden of disgrace to the offender. See, if the, vic the victim of sexual assault, of rape, is carrying a burden of disgrace for that. And uh, Dr. Ford made it very clear that she had been carrying this burden for 30 years. There's, if you, I don't know if you, you watched this down here, I, you know, it's, it, but, but it was a very dramatic kind of thing. And, but that's what was going on. This paragraph is just a description of what was going on there. Um, in this way, while acknowledgement from the offender was important, she never got that. She never got the offender to say, yeah, listen, when I was 18 years old, I got drunk a lot and I did stuff and I'm ashamed of it. And she would have loved to have heard that, okay? And he, you know, he might've gotten on the court if he had said that, you know? Um, while acknowledgement from the offender was important, validation from bystanders was of equal or greater importance. And for these reasons, Herman found that victims' needs and wishes are often diametrically opposed to the requirements of formal legal proceedings. So you got that? What a victim wants, um, and, and the restorative justice situation sets this up, I think. Um, it's setting up a place where um, the burden of disgrace that the victim has been feeling can be um, transferred to the offender, okay? The problem, of course, and that's the point of this article, is that rape and sexual um, violence is the kind of crime that we do not typically say is eligible for restorative justice procedures. We want to direct that right into the courts and, and have at it. And the problem with that there are very few people who wind up getting convicted. Why? It's a he said, she said. There was nobody else there. The woman did not go down to the police department and subject herself to examination, and there isn't a rape kit that has evidence. You know, and that's, again, that's what happened in the, um, in the situation recently in Washington. This was 30 some years ago, and I think a lot of the people on that committee evaluating it just said, well, there's no evidence. We can't do this. Um, but what the victim, you know, and part of the question there is, do we pay attention to what the victim wants and needs? Um, it seems like the, the restorative justice effort um, is trying to give attention to the, the needs that a victim has. And that's what, what, what she was um, sharing there. Uh, she, she wanted to have a voice. She wanted to um, expose the offender as an offender. Um, you know, he had, um, he had just given a, an interview on, um, on a television network um, with his wife sitting next to him and um, he made himself sound like a choir boy. That's the language everybody used, that um, you know, I was just a wonderful, and then all this evidence comes out that he drank a lot, and, and, you know, and that makes it more likely um, that some kind of sexual violation could occur. Um, the effect of alcohol is to lower inhibitions and things like that, so um, if he has a history of heavy drinking and, and, and all of that, it, it all becomes more believable. Um, so anyways, this woman came forward and made this accusation, and she, she, was, she wanted the, the community to denounce the crime. And I think she got that. The crime was denounced. But I'm not sure that um, it, it, it turned out... Um, you know, the, the way that she wanted. Um, um, 
it's not necessarily that the disgrace was transferred. It was for a lot of people, but a lot of people said, 30 years ago, let's forget it. So we got into some things like that. But um, th this is all kind of within the context of, um, of um, restorative justice too, because uh, this, this article about the, um, the rape and the search for justice is, is making the case that um, victims do not necessarily, they do not necessarily want to see um, the whole criminal justice apparatus engaged, um, you know, to take this person and, and put them in jail. And I mean, in the United States, we used to execute people for rape. It was, we raped, uh, we, um, we executed basically black men for killing or for raping white women. And um, when the death penalty was overturned in 1972, the, um, the one punishment that really was eliminated was the idea of executing um, people for rape, that it was a disproportionate penalty. It was a cruel and unusual punishment. But just execution was not. But it was execution for rape actually was um, eliminated. And the states that had it were southern states, and the people executed for it were we're black, and we get into all all that stuff. Okay, um, so so th this is to the to think about restorative justice as something where the the victim's viewpoint plays a large role. Do you think the victim's viewpoint should play a large role in thinking about punishment? Or should we just get back to the idea of impartial justice? If there's an offense, it's an offense against society. And um, we should um, you know, just establish what we think is a reasonable penalty for that kind of offense and run people through the process. So, I guess one of the questions that has to be asked is whether restorative justice makes things too personal. You know, do you do you have thoughts about that or questions or issues? No. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, again, the focus of restorative justice is on um, um, trying to repair the, the harm between the offender and the victim. And um, one of the, th the things that's coming up in, the, in this, this article that we're looking at, um, again, this is on page six, is that the community members or organizations take a more active role. Um, there is in, uh, um, there's a tradition in some communities, again, I don't know what the situation is down here, here in Brazil, um, but in the United States, there have been some um, um, efforts in the community to deal with people who, um, um, well, they're, they're, they're at, in trouble of some kind. So it could be a criminal offense. It could also be um, a, a, a student in high school who is um, just not doing well, and there are all kinds of problems at home. And there's this program that has been devised called Wraparound, W-R-A-P, Wraparound. And what they do is um, um, they, will, they will take this person in, who's in trouble, and I think it's related to the restorative justice ideal that we have here, and we will put that person um, at, a, at a table with all the people who can provide services, evaluation, direction to help with the problems that this person's facing. So there could be a social worker there. There could be the principal of the school. There could be clergy people there. There could be social agency representatives there. And they all um, give attention to the problem that is being faced by the, 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 purpose, the person who is being wrapped around. And the idea of this is to um, figure out with all of these different voices there and with the victim, if you will, 
Um, what is it that would best improve this situation and lead this person into a better place so that they are um, not at odds with their community, but they are functioning in harmony with their community. That's the objective of it, okay? Um, so I, you could have a police officer there. You could have all kinds of, you could have a lawyer there. You could have somebody from the district, attorney, you know, a prosecutor there. Um, and, and, you know, maybe a prosecutor says, if you stay on this course, you're, you're gonna wind up facing criminal charges or something, you know, and there are people there who say this can be avoided. There are, there are things that we can do. Maybe we need to think about getting you a better job or we need to get you um, hooked up with some better study um, skills and people to help tutor you. And, and, but you wrap this person around with, with services. So it's, it's one of the um, kinds of solutions that it seems like restorative justice would be interested in, in pursuing. And, um, and what's going on there is that the, the person who is the center of attention, the, or, or if it's, this is a, a criminal thing, the, the victim of the crime is in dialogue, okay? And um, um, there are different, you know, there are different forms of dialogue um, there, there, um, I, I come at the dialogue issue around um, issues of, of, of interfaith or interreligious dialogue. I, I run this dialogue center where I work, and um, um, there's a professor at Harvard who has done some, Jane Smith is her name, and, and she's done some studies of, of dialogue, and she's identified seven different kinds of dialogue. and. Um, uh, some of them are productive and some of them are not so productive. Um, one of the first kinds of dialogue is just to get, get acquainted, get to know you sort of thing. So in the wake of 9-11 in the United States, there were lots of um, churches, Christian churches, that reached out to um, Muslim communities and they would bring um, a Muslim person down into the basement of the church for a Tuesday night supper and tell us about Islam and they would have this kind of dialogue uh, about religion. It's just informational, but it's also a way of um, um, uh, making people who may be fearful of the strangeness of otherness more comfortable around um, people they just don't know. Um, so this has limited function and abilities uh, tied to it, but, it, but it's, it, you know, in certain contexts, it, it can provide a benefit. And there are different kinds of dialogue. Uh, in, in the religious realm, the kind of dialogue that doesn't go anywhere um, constructive is theological dialogue. Because, um, um, you know, if you sit a Christian down whose, whose belief system is tied up to um, redemption by an act of Christ who, who died on the cross, um, and you then sit that person down with a Muslim who, whose understanding is that Jesus didn't die on a cross. It's not part of the understanding. Um, that would be contradictory um, to think that God would allow an innocent person to be killed. So whatever happened in that situation, and some of the Muslim theologians have argued that um, uh, somebody else was substituting for Jesus on the cross and all these kinds of things. But did you see the point? The point is if, you, if your religious faith depends on this and somebody else's religious faith says, well, no, that can't possibly be the case, how are you supposed to <laughs> figure something like that out? So having um, competing theologies doesn't work well. Where you can create some um, important dialogue is actually around ethics. Why? Because ethics is supposed to be universal. And even religious ethics reaches out around universal things. Everybody who's religious wants to affirm the idea that you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't kill, these normative principles that we associate with the, the moral point of view. Religious people um, tie up to the, um, 
uh, to the moral point of view. So, um, the, 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 one of the things that when we talk about dialogue, and we talk about the kinds of dialogue that really are constructive and that lead somewhere, um, there are ideas that um, there is a possible transformation that takes place. So that when a dialogue takes place in something like a restorative justice um, um, environment, it's conceivable that um, two hurt people coming into a situation, two pained people, somebody pained by guilt, somebody pain, pained by, by shame for being the victim of a, of a crime, could, as a result of the negotiations and the conversation and the getting to know you kind of thing, um, find themselves in a different place. And I think that's what dialogue is ultimately trying to do. It's an openness to a transformation so that you don't simply go into a dialogue with the idea of reconfirming all the beliefs that you went into. You go into it with an openness to being changed, okay? And that's why I say it, 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 it doesn't work so much around theological ideas because so much of our identities can be tied up with theological ideas that we don't just pass them aside. But in the moral realm, in talking about what's right and wrong, um, there, there's, there's some room for change. I didn't understand that about you. Um, I didn't um, appreciate that you felt that way. And because I now know that you feel that way and that you have this hurt, um, I, you know, I am responding to that and I'm affected by that and I'm changed by that and it, it changes how I think about it. So um, there can be a kind of transformation that, that comes out of encounter that way, okay? So um, in thinking about um, uh, restorative justice efforts, we, we want to think about the, the role of the victim and what the victim wants. And um, um, I, I think this, this stuff um, um, from the, um, the Claire McGinn article on feminism, rape, and the search for justice is, is, is really interesting myself. Um, really interesting. Um, uh, restorative justice is one means um, to achieve this end of um, um, uh, simply getting away from punitive and coercive relations. It requires the offender to have admitted responsibility, thereby giving some measure of vindication to the victim. It also offers a form of offender accountability by demanding that offenders explain their actions and listen to the harm that they have caused. Okay, uh, it may be valuable to bear in mind here that restorative justice is an alternative punishment, not an alternative to punishment. But um, the idea is that restorative justice could carry out the, tra this is important on, on 839, um, the traditional functions of criminal justice, retribution, rehabilitation, reintegration, individual and public protection, and it does so better than formal justice does. Okay, so, um, you know, we started off asking about um, what, whether it's coercive, whether restorative justice is coercive. Um, here's a, a response to that, that if we pay attention to the, to the victim, if we, we focus on repairing the relationship, if we listen to the offender, um, that this restorative situation that is being set up is actually doing the work of punishment, okay? But it's punishment more like the Bennett material we were talking about, you know, the first and second day. It's a broader, uh, more inclusive, um, it's also a gentler way of thinking about um, restorative justice where um, the dessert issue is not all about you've caused pain so you're getting pain back. It's saying there's pain that's coming back but it's the pain of guilt, 
It's the pain of um, empathizing with and, and being aware that you have hurt someone. Uh, that is a painful thing to, to realize. And there are offenders who aren't there, who, um, and maybe the restorative justice situation becomes the occasion where that happens, okay? And it, that can feed back into the idea that um, um, people experience this encounter as if it were a um, retributive um, encounter, as if it were a, it was experienced as a punishment. Okay. Reactions to any of that? So that's please. Uh, how can we achieve a fair treatment if the victim? talk with the offender and still wants a harsh punishment. Uh, even a, a punishment that the law can present, like a capital punishment, that this isn't considered. Okay, so the victim wants harsh punishment. Um, then that's what will be pursued. The, the idea of restorative justice is that people have got to be open to it, okay? they have got to be, um, they've got to volunteer to do this. And if the victim doesn't want to play, the victim doesn't have to play. So that's the answer to that one. Yeah, yeah. So. So other, other questions or issues? Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Lloyd. Actually, I, I read other papers, but uh, Lloyd is discussing mainly the paper restorative justice and civic accountability for punishment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I have questions about this. But, okay. Uh, I remember that I I read the forgiveness paper. I <laughs> made some several questions about forgiveness, but about uh, the issue of restorative justice, uh, let me ask you something. Comment and ask, ask me something. Uh, I'm remembering of traditional theories uh, of uh, civil, uh, the civil society, or, or for example, the contract for this. Uh, uh, let me re uh, remember the I one idea of the uh, traditional contractualist theory. Uh, take, for example, uh, Hobbes. Uh, in a Hobbesian uh, traditional account, in the state of nature, people, uh, the concept of justice does not e exist in the state of nature. Uh, people do harm, and so they are harmed. Uh, and maybe they feel themselves harmed uh, and try to uh, correct this, in a sense, in a state of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so it remembers me the idea that uh, a kind of punishment exists in the state of nature, even in, in a Hobbesian story. Uh, a kind of punishment that is uh, 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 move it by resentment and is uh, re re uh, retributive. Okay. Uh, re ret retribution. retribution, yeah. There is retribution. Yes. Uh, if I was stolen, I can stole. Yeah. Uh, if I was uh, harmed, I can harm. Uh, so, an eye to, to an eye uh, uh, conception. But, uh, uh, for an eye to for a tooth. So, uh, but in Hobbes' theory, there is not justice in the state of nature. Uh, for other, uh, for others, uh, for example, contractualists, for other contractualists like, uh, for example, Locke, there is justice. There is natural justice in the state of nature. 
So uh, we move for a civil society because it's better for us, but uh, uh, in a local account, there is uh, justice in the state of nature, natural justice. Uh, but in a Hobbesian story, uh, there is not justice. Or, 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 or at least in, a, uh, in this interpretation that is quite general and, and may be misleading. Uh, the point is, uh, the, concept, the conception that uh, restorative justice mm -hmm. is a kind of justice that makes justice for the civil so uh, relationship, for the fact that we are in a society and we are related to each other. Right. So, uh, right. uh, the concept of restoration, including, uh, mm -hmm. seems in this account that I write, uh, uh, I, 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 I've read the Zur uh, paper now, uh, so I, I didn't read this entirely, but uh, it's similar to your account uh, about the, the, the problem of uh, What other concept that is what forgiveness Forgive, forgiveness forgiveness, uh, forgiveness yeah. Uh, yeah because your your account of forgiveness is that forgiveness is something that we look for in a in a civil arrangement in 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 a in a, in a uh, relate uh, in a in a in a kind of uh, society in a society or in a kind of uh, system that we are related to each other so there is community there is society and uh, in a state of nature account uh, a story fictitious or more realistic uh, we don't have society uh, maybe we have community but we don't have society uh, and uh, my point is uh, could we say uh, that uh, uh, in, a, in an account that there is not justice conceptually in the state of nature condition, uh, but there is justice in a uh, civil society. Uh, could we say that the restorative concept of justice is, a, is not a, a concept plus, in the same, in a, in a sense that is a adversarial or an alternative concept of justice, but is the proper concept of justice uh, uh, in a kind of in relationship, involvement with each other that is characteristic of society. Uh, so, uh, in the process of uh, uh, getting out from the state of nature, we build mm -hmm. the concept of justice, yeah. and it's part of and the part of this concept is to restore mm -hmm. because. Restoration in this concept only exists if we live in society. Uh, so this is not, uh, 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 we cannot think about that in a state of nature, that there is not the concept of justice. Uh, this is the Robesian state of nature. Uh, 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 the point is, uh, in a Lokian concept of a state of nature, there is justice in the state of nature, and it is intrinsically uh, uh, retributive in the criminal uh, right. in the in the criminal justice. It's right. intrinsic retributive. So the, the 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 transformation of the state of nature, a Lokian a Lokian state of nature, to a state of nature, uh, not a state of nature, a civil society, there is not the construction of another concept of justice, but uh, that, not the con that there is not the emergent, this, uh, 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 justice does not emerge uh, in civil society, but is rather maybe improved, uh, uh, because retribution mm. still exists, yeah. and we can, but not necessarily, improve the concept of justice in civil society by the concept of restoration. In this sense, in a Lokian story, restorative justice is less strong. Uh, is, 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 a, is, is maybe a, 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 a something contingent, 
something that people can abide or not, something that society can uh, say yes or no, but in a Hobbesian account, okay. that, that's the, 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 the story. Uh, if, the, if it is a, a kind of justice, it is part of the concept of justice. So it is built with the, uh, the, the creating of society. I'm not, I, 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 I'm not sure if you understood my, my point, but this well. is the point of, let me say, uh, in a kind of uh, Bernard Williams concept of geneolo genealogy of justice. So we could say that there is a genealogy of justice, not the concept of uh, Nietzsche, but uh, Bernard Williams. Uh, the, ge the genealogy of justice is this, uh, the, the, gen the conceptual genealogy of justice. Maybe we uh, create justice, but uh, just in, in this Hobbesian account that I uh, 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 say, that I offer, uh, a, a society that does not have restorative justice is deficient in justice. It, this is not, uh, not, but in a Lockean account, it's not deficient. It's simply another form of uh, organization of society. Do you understand my point? Well, um, <laughs> my, my short answer to that, um, I mean, you, you packed a lot in there, okay? Um, we're talking about a state of nature and Locke and Hobbes and, and all of that. But I, I, you, you did say something that I think is, a, is the answer to your own question. It is the idea that we have this idea of justice and um, uh, as we have devised uh, the concept of justice, we've done it around the idea of desert, that you, um, we meet out punishments, we, we hand out punishments um, according to offense, we try to keep them proportional, you know, and all of that. The thing we don't often do um, and it may be because um, we are so close to a state of nature all the time that we don't often um, think about the ends of justice. What is the point of pursuing justice? Um, when we think about punishment as a particular kind of topic, what is the purpose of punishment? Okay, um, we, can, we can just say, well, you offended and um, we are now gonna pay you back for that, okay? You can do this sort of non-reflectively. You don't have to be philosophical or um, reflective to um, do a knee-jerk reaction. You, you hit me, I'm gonna hit you back. Um, it's, uh, it's unreflective, okay? Um, and there, there's something close to the state of nature in that response, okay? That, okay, and I, yeah, and I, and I understand, I think I got that. Um, and I would agree with that. Um, uh, um, in a state of nature, you know, if um, I'm hauling my deer, my dead deer, back to my hut to cook, cook it, and you come and steal it from me, I, you know, I'm going to kill you, and that's it. You know, it, it's it's sort of unre you have no right to take this from me, and you're going to get whatever punishment. You know, it's just like that. It, um, it it it's just it's unreflective. It okay, so. I think what's going on with these um, folks talking about restorative justice is that they're recognizing that um, uh, retribution and the idea of deserts is a part of how we think about justice, okay? But um, there are different ways to conceive this and to think about this and to reflect on the meaning of it. Um, even if we're going to keep categories like retribution alive. I get this is what Bennett did in this article. We did spend some time really going through. Um, B Bennett expanded the idea of retribution in light of a question he asked, which was, what is the point of this? Why are we doing this? If you ask the question, what is the end we are seeking by this justice, it has to do with things like creating um, social harmony, to take somebody who has um, broken from the moral community, is not outside the moral community, 
but has somehow offended it and broken their relationship with it to heal that relation, to bring that relationship back in. That's, and you, can you do that under the category of retribution? Um, well, it sounds odd to do that under the category of retribution, but I, again, depends on how you talk about retribution. If you've got Bennett's idea of retribution, yeah, why? Because um, what you want to do is make this offender aware that they've done something morally wrong. And as soon as I realize that I've done something morally wrong, I'm going to feel guilt about it. Okay, I'm going to internalize that. I'm going to feel shame. I mean, this is, you know, this is what we try to do if, uh, you know, if you're a parent. Um, you know, when you're a parent, you hold the, the rule card, um, the idea that you can't hit your sister and you, there are things that you can't do, all right? And um, as you get trained and you mature and you um, come to, um, you know, what Aristotle said, you can't teach ethics to children. Did he say that somewhere? But, but, um, uh, but after a while, the, the point is you do internalize this. That's what your conscience is. Your conscience is that you don't need the external rules anymore because they've been internalized. So if you and I have a debate here and we have a disagreement, we know that we're not going to go out, um, let's go out and settle this like men, you know, with fisticuffs. We're going to beat each other up and that'll, that's no solution to anything. So we've got to find a way to deal with our disagreements and with our, with our problems. And I think, um, I think what's going on is that the concept of, of retribution um, does have an end point, and if we keep the end point of it in mind, um, it's going to talk about the restoration of social harmony, and it's going to talk about educating um, uh, offenders to understand that what they did was morally wrong, and the, the result of that is actually going to have a utilitarian effect, which is to create a better society looking ahead to the future where fewer and fewer of these kinds of offenses will go on because people are more educated about moral meaning. They know what is right and what is wrong and they know what the experience is like doing something wrong because they receive punishment for it. And what was the punishment? Well, it could have been a slap on the hands, but, but it, 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 it the most important piece of it, of that retribution, is the guilt that a person feels for being aware that they have violated the, the moral norms. Okay? So, what this means in terms of um, retribution goes back to this idea that um, restorative justice, this is on, on, in your article here, and I, I just read this, I'm going to read it to you again, this, this, is, the, this is in the rape article. Um, so this is not, um, I'm sorry, you were talking out of the other one, but, but I, I think this is a response to it. This is on page 839 in the Feminism, Rape, and Search for Justice. It's, a, it, it's um, yeah, Claire McGinn, McGlynn. It's on Feminism, Rape, and the Search for Justice. Did you have that article? Um, well, anyways, what, what she says is that um, um, feminists, um, let me see, um, both for and against restorative justice all agree that offenses of sexual violence warrant a significant response. So we want, when, a, when violence takes place and an offense is committed, we want to respond to it. Okay, okay. Um, her argument is that restorative justice could carry out the traditional functions of criminal justice, which is retribution, right? Um, and then there's a dash, retribution, rehabilitation, reintegration, that's the end point that we're looking for. Individual and public protection, that's the utilitarian piece of it. Better, we have another dash there, better than formal justice does, by which we mean kind of a um, retribution close to the state of nature in your terms, okay? And her next sentence is, or the next sentence here is, in other words, it may offer more effective justice. So the point is that this restorative justice meets the objectives of justice. It serves the purpose of punishment, 
but it winds up doing it in a better way, a more effective way, something that meets the ends that we're seeking, something that pays attention to the idea of deserts through guilt and shame and those moral emotions, and that has a, um, a socially beneficial consequence to it. So it, it's, it's a better way of thinking about justice, which is what I took you to be asking about, is, is there a better way, is the restorative piece um, a better way of doing justice? And, and if we think about concepts like forgiveness and remorse and some of these moral emotions, they, they come into play with all that. And it, it's, it's adding more levels of, of meaning to it. And we, you know, and those are all things that can be talked about kind of individually. But the, the big picture thing here is that um, um, when we think about justice, we have these, these um, and, and we think about punishment, and justice um, serving, or punishment serving the ends of justice, we need to pay attention to what those ends are, okay? And we, we often do not. And I think our, you know, I was um, uh, talking to somebody who visited the class the other day who's, who's a, a, a criminal attorney, and I was asking him about um, what prisons are like, and he was telling me about the prison in Porto Alegre that's got, what do you say, 5,000? Was it 5,000? Uh, inmates in the prison here in Porto Alegre, um, something like that, and it, uh, horrible. Yeah, it's just you know, j just a horrible thing. And um, we have we have prisons like that in the United States. Um, uh, well, he told me some things that I, 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 I yeah, I mean he 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 shared. Um, um, that, that women cannot get sanitary napkins and things like that. And I'm not sure that that goes on so much in American prisons. Those, those kinds of things are sort of taken care of. But, but, but the, the, the point, I'm not trying to do a thing here. Um, uh, the point is that when you have things like that going on where you are warehousing people, okay, you are not thinking about their futures. You're not thinking about reintegrating them into society. You're not thinking about making them productive members of society. Um, you are not paying attention to the ends of justice, okay? You are not thinking about what punishment is supposed to be doing in a constructive way to create a better society. Restorative justice is trying to say, I think, that we need to be conscious of all of that. When we devise criminal justice systems, um, um, when we, we need to think about integrating creative um, ways to let victims be heard, to let um, punishments um, um, not simply be destructive, one of the worst things you can do is send a person to prison because they will just get worse. Prison doesn't, you know, if we're talking about prisons where you warehouse people, where we put them in there and throw away the key and we'll see you in 10 years, we'll feed you and all that, but we're not gonna do anything for you. Um, you're not making a person better. You are not creating um, a person who's gonna come out of prison and be a constructive citizen. Prisons can be very destructive environments, okay? Everybody knows that, that's not news to anybody. Um, and it's not serving the ends of justice. The question is, um, you, you can, the idea of locking somebody up and throwing away the key, that's an expression we use in the United States a good bit, to talk about warehousing people and doing nothing um, that's re rehabilitative or um, um, constructive. Um, locking them up and throwing away the key serves a particular vision of retribution, okay? But so does restorative justice. And if a person is not morally developed enough to experience the guilt 
the interior changes, the educational changes that are supposed to take place as a result of justice, they may very well experience what is going on in a restorative justice situation as coercive or as a punishment. Okay, and um, we, th that's kind of the question we started off with. Okay. Uh, okay, your, your answer is uh, interesting, and, and let me make a comparison with the point I presented. Okay. okay. Comparing Hobbesian stories and Lokian stories. I think Hobbesian stories is similar to what I should call a Humean, Dave Hume story about justice. Justice is an artificial virtue. Uh, and uh, actually for a Lokian, no, justice is an, not artificial. Justice exists is in the natural uh, law domain. But uh, 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 let me, uh, I think the point of restorative justice is only, uh, can only be understood well uh, uh, if we take into account the first uh, stories I, I told. Hobbesian and uh, human, but not in a Lockean story, because a Lockean story, for example, presents to us a view of justice as, as for example, the libertarian understand libertarians. We are, we are, uh, we, uh, uh, society or community is only derivatively. We, we exist as individuals, atoms, mm -hmm. and so justice is a matter of I and you not a matter of society, no, it's not an issue for society. Uh, or, or the simplification is that. But uh, let me point uh, a question about forgiveness that I think is related to this, okay. that is, okay. uh, why justice? Why forgiveness matter for justice? Uh, in the story uh, that I ca I'm calling a Lokian story, forgiveness is not a matter of justice. Uh, uh, Mm, forgiveness is important. People can forgive, uh, and maybe uh, this is a matter of policy. Uh, people will live better if they forgive. People will live better if they have a system that has restorative justice. But this is not, in this story that I call Locken, uh, this is not conceptually inherent to the concept of justice. <laughs> Uh, it's a plus, it's a plus. For example, compared to societies, one society, people are retributive, and, but not restorative. <laughs> not, they don't forgive, they don't forgive, uh, okay? Uh, in the other society, people uh, forgive uh, when forgiveness is appropriate, and they have restorative system, and the point is, for the Lokan, which society are more just than the other? And the answer is, they are both just. Both of them are just. Uh, the distinction between them is not on justice. The distinction between them is maybe on what is better, for to live well. Uh, people can live well in a society with restorative justice. Can, people can live well with each other psychologically, with, uh, with less resentment, with uh, a restorative system, and if they live with Christian values and forgive. So they live well, but not necessarily more just. So uh, because justice, uh, including in this story, is only a matter of giving to Caesar what Caesar owed not a matter of being good. So, uh, uh, what I'm suggesting is that maybe if we understand justice as like human understood, artificial, uh, we can include restoration and forgiveness as a, as a, as a matter of uh, what is not only living well, but being just. So, just Justice is another, uh, 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 is a richer concept in this uh, uh, contest. In the first instance, justice is a concept. Okay? So actually, that is part of a response to what you're saying. Justice is a concept. Government is a concept, right? Okay? Think of all the kinds of governments there are. 
we can have fascist governments, we can have democracies, we can have um, um, tribal governments, we can have um, parliamentary governments, we can have local governments, national governments, world governments, blah, blah, blah. And, and we acquire an ability, I'll get a little Wittgensteinian in here on you, but we acquire ability to use the concept government in different ways as we acquire competence, as we grow up. If I'm five years old and my daddy says to me something about the government, I just understand something very basic about I, I'm American or, or something. It's just real basic. But when you're you know, 25 years old and you have a, a degree in political science from a university, you understand a great deal more about government. So the concept of government becomes very rich and thick, right? And the only reason I'm using that example is because I think justice is a, um, it, it is a concept that um, it, it permits a lot of different kinds of meanings to it. And one of the, you know, when you talk about Hobbes in a state of nature and uh, or, or, or Locke talking about a state of nature or something like that. It, it's a certain kind of notion of government. We talk about retribution being an eye for an eye, a Hammurabi code notion. Well, you know, we, we, we mentioned in here that before Hammurabi, um, you know, 2,000 years before the Common Era begins, um, what justice meant was my tribe beats your tribe and we just all go to war and kill one another. But Hammurabi, um, uh, created a change in how we think about justice. Jesus comes along and, and um, basically says, well, that Hammurabi notion is no good. That Hammurabi notion had found its way into the Hebrew Bible, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus comes along and says, you've heard it said. Well, you could say, well, that's not justice. Forgiveness has come in and all that. But, but Aristotle, um, Aristotle thought that, that forgiveness did play a part in justice. And it's another um, movement in the concept of justice. It's not a static notion. You know, we can think about um, uh, justice as applying in a, um, in a distributive sense. We can think about it in a retributive sense. We can, you know, we can get very sophisticated in what we want to think about justice. We get Rawlsian about it. We, there are all these different, um, um, ways to, to think about justice and, um, and, and its meaning. And the it, it's, it's not like there is some normative idea that we're all in on that um, settles the question of what justice is. If we're going to talk about justice, you have to tell me what notion of justice it is you're talking about. And, um, uh, and, and, then we have to know if I've got the capacity to understand that. Are you talking about some kind of notion of justice I've never thought about as a notion of justice before? It's possible. It's possible. Um, that's, that's one of the things that goes on with, with concepts. In order to understand a concept, you have to develop the personal capacity to understand it. Right? Um, which is why we send you to school, so that your understanding at the age of 25 with a degree in political science means that you have a, um, a much richer, deeper concept of government than you would have had as a five-year-old, something like that, okay? So the concept um, uh, comes to have very different um, notions, and it's a very rich um, idea. The point of the restorative thing is that it's a, it's a valid and legitimate notion of justice. It actually uses other ideas of justice as part of its content. It has a dimension to it um, that's retributive. It has a dimension to it um, that's rehabilitative and reintegrative. That's part of the end point of what we want. It's, um, it's, um, it's a notion that plays in on protection, okay? So rather than setting up, there is a notion of justice that's utilitarian and it means such and such, there's a retributive notion, blah, blah, blah. You can develop a notion of justice that actually includes those things. They're all a part of it, okay? Now it looks like they shouldn't be in there. It looks like maybe they're contradictory, but who says? 
you know, um, why can a notion of justice not um, pay attention to the kind of benefit that society is going to re receive if, in fact, a person feels the desert of guilt as a result of being aware that they have committed a moral wrong? Okay, why can't there be a utilitarian benefit from a retributive idea of justice? We do a lot to keep these things separate, but we could come up with an idea of justice that actually says they both have a role to play. And I think that's what restorative justice is actually trying to do. And there are implications for what it would look like in society. Maybe we get away from just having um, um, these determinate um, sentences that if you do such and such, it's a 20 year sentence, so you do such and such, we give you 20 years. Well, what if you're a quick learner? What if you really do come to an understanding that what you did was wrong and that it's time for you to um, um, accept um, your responsibility in society again and you submit to um, some kind of restorative program where you are, um, you know, helping the person that you harmed and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, why couldn't that come into play? So I'm just trying to say that um, when, we deal with, with con when we deal with the concept of justice, we're dealing with something complex. I mean, for, you know, for Aristotle, it was a virtue. It was one of the cardinal virtues because there's such a thing as a just person, okay? And that's different than thinking about societal justice. Okay, societal justice doesn't mean that society is simply made up of all just people. Okay, it means that society has got to um, uh, has got to figure out ways of dealing with things within the moral community when moral norms are upset, and we need to restore things to their balance. But that means that we have to have some idea in view as to what the end of um, um, a just society is. So it's a complex notion. And I, I didn't hear you saying anything in your, in your statements that, um, that denies any of this. Um, it, it's, it's just that I wanted to respond by saying all of those ideas, I think, can come into play um, in, a, in a notion like restorative justice. We don't typically think about um, retributive justice as including a notion of forgiveness, right? We don't, we don't. but Aristotle did. Long time ago, he gave thought to that. And um, when the Christians come along, you know, they think forgiveness is a duty. You know, you're, you're supposed to do that. Well, there's nothing in morality that demands that you forgive somebody who's harmed you. I don't think. I don't think reason w w would say, I have a duty to forgive you. You know, you killed my wife. I'm supposed to forgive you for that? I mean, what, did, what does that even mean? Um, I mean, the only thing I can forgive you for is the harm you've caused me. Um, I'm, I don't have standing to forgive you for what you did to my dead wife. Um, but what, is, what does it mean to talk about forgiveness being a duty? Okay? Is that just? Well, Christians think it is, I think. Don't Christians think that forgiveness is a part of justice? I, I think they do. But that's an idea that uh, a lot of people wouldn't accept. But that's part of the richness of the concept. And we and we we um, we analyze that, we criticize it, we we try to figure it out. It's a rich justice is a very rich concept. Does any of that help? <laughs> is this of interest to the rest of you? Who um, I, I'm just kind of curious. I. Or do you, some of the rest of you have uh, comments to make? I, I don't need to be just carrying on here.
Do you think restorative justice can include retribution? That it can include um, something utilitarian? That it can include, um, um, you know, like um, reintegration of an offender? That that's a part of what justice can include? Or Any, any responses? Yeah, go ahead, please, please. <laughs> I think my comment is just about that uh, we have our, we have a lot of unjust uh, actions. Yes. So I think it's nice to mix uh, together uh, uh, mercy and apologize and utilitarianism concept and the retributive concept to you can apply to many more cases than just one concept more strict is yeah. common. Yeah. Well, I, again, I, I think that's how concepts work. Um, I, I think what concepts do is they, they um, enclose an area of concern and as we um, and of interest and, uh, and ideas, and as we become um, more sophisticated, as we learn more, the concept gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, and you, you take a concept of, you know, what is a person, and um, um, think about um, what a doctor means by person, and what a lawyer means by person. I mean, a, a lawyer thinks a corporation you know, American law acknowledges that corporations are persons. Okay, um, so wow, I, that's that's taking the concept of person and just expanding it. But it's something we do, and and we do this all the time. And we're talking about doing this with the concept of justice. And I think the restorative justice movement, which has been, you know, growing for the last 30, 35, 40 years, whatever it is. Um, is, is asking us to think beyond traditional classic ideas of retribution, eye for an eye. But if you walk down the street and, um, you know, ask just a person, um, you know, what does justice mean, you may very well get eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, you know, they're, they're not in our seminar reading about restorative justice. And it doesn't mean they can't learn about that. And if they get picked up by a crime, you know, for a crime, um, they're going to want to know about it. Um, because who, you know, if we universalize, who would want to wind up in a prison where people are throwing away the key? Um, who would not want to have a chance to get integrated back into the moral community and around a notion of justice that says that's the purpose of what we're going to do here? That's the purpose of this dialogue that we are going to have. You need to hear the harm that you caused this person. You need to hear that. That person has a need to tell you about that. And as a result of that encounter, everybody's got a deeper understanding of what's going on. And um, as a result, other things can happen. And what these other things that happen reflect what we mean by justice. Okay, so we're thinking about justice now beyond um, just improving society in the future or about making sure everybody gets their desserts. You, you earn what we do to you through punishment. Okay, so we're, we're, we're just trying to expand this. And I think that's, that's what a concept is. Um, and we're, what we're doing is kind of analyzing the concept of justice around, around the concept of punishment. And beginning with that Bennett article, we've been expanding our idea of punishment to include moral emotions um, as well as coercive things that are done by external agencies and institutions and things. Okay, so it's a complex, it's a complex business we're, we're into here. Other than thought, take a break. Okay, sounds good. Well, we'll get going again. Um, 
I just wanted to ask this question. I understand that um, um, those of you who are taking this um, seminar um, are going to be writing a paper about these issues. Is that right? Is it, is, that's right. I w have, have you given thought to what your topics are going to be or um, what you want to write about? Have, have, anybody have anything they'd want to share about that? I'm just, I'm just curious to know. Um, yeah, uh, I was thinking in my paper to work about the relationship between law and morality oh. in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. It's about the question that I did, uh, I asked you mm -hmm. in the beginning of the class. Uh, I agreed with you. For me, there is a common moral agreement into the legal system. Then it's uh, the moral evaluated or the moral consideration are necessary conditions, uh, even though not sufficient, okay. but are necessary conditions for the criminal justice system. My idea is working okay. about it. Okay, very good. That's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Any of the rest of you have anything? You have an area? Hmm. Thank you. Um, in the first class, you were talking about Peter's trust and freedom and resentment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing my dissertation with the orientation of Professor Dennis, uh, and the central point is the uh, compatibilism defended by Strauss, a kind of compatibilism. Uh, the central point of Strauss seems, seems to be that belief the truth of determinism would not affect our moral feelings. The central point seems to be that. <clears throat> My question is, if you agree that believing if the truth of determinism doesn't affect our moral feelings, our moral sense, motivation, oh. if, if you agree with trust in that point. Yeah. I think that's a complicated issue. Good, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I, that's that's an interesting issue to to get after. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I the first time I read Strawson, um, I, I had trouble understanding um, how he was using the idea of determinism. You know, in the article, I, th I think it's complicated the way he expresses himself about that. Um, but um, it, it's, it, it is tied up with a utilitarianism. That's where he, I think that's where he goes with it, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, but, but I, those are, I, yeah, I, I think we will all benefit from um, what wisdom you can bring to that issue. And so, good, good. Uh, I have one question about the sure. restorative justice. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, to this kind of justice, how the conditions of the offenders affect the punishment? Conditions like uh, how old they are, um, how uh, reasonable they are, or conditions like uh, how much political power they have. Well, that's, that's kind of relevant to what you want to be talking about because I think those, um, um, when we think about those kinds of characteristics, even though they, they don't fit um, impartial justice when we talk about that, what they do fit is um, um, the, the idea that our reactive attitudes can certainly be affected um, by um, 
some of those accidental characteristics such as age um, or gender or, or things like that. And, and sometimes, um, not to mitigate, but sometimes even to become harsher. Um, if you are harmed by somebody who's really wealthy and you're a person of um, limited financial means, you could have some very deep hostilities towards that person and you would never come into a restorative justice situation um, because of something like that. So those reactive attitudes can very much affect um, whether restorative justice even becomes an option for um, dealing with a particular situation between persons. So that's what I would say in response. To, that's a good question. That, uh, um, that's a nice way to bring, uh, uh, you know, and then if, if, if somebody harms you who's um, uh, mentally ill or retarded, uh, limited intelligence, something like that, um, the reactive attitudes just don't pursue punishment at all. You know, they, I mean, they, punishment as an option could actually drop out of the picture um, because the reactive attitudes just don't develop. Um, uh, so, yeah, so there are things that, um, I mean, the word we use is mitigate um, the desire to, the desire to, to return harm for harm or something. Yeah, but good, good. That's that's good stuff. That's good stuff. You could you could get a paper out of that. <laughs> yeah, you know the the hard thing about writing a paper always is getting a topic. I have to I have to write a a newspaper column um, up where I live in the in the valley where I live. It's called the Lehigh Valley. There are actually three cities that are very close to one another, and there's a major newspaper. Um, there are like a million and a half people who live in this in this valley, even though the city I live in, Bethlehem, only has a population of 70,000. Um, but I have to write this newspaper column, and um, I never know what to write about. You know, it's just a blank piece of paper, a blank screen in front of me, and I have to come up with uh, 800 words, and, and uh, you know, there it goes out to a couple of hundred thousand people. And, um, it's, it's, it's interesting for all the stuff I've done as an academic, nobody cares about it, but if I'm, you know, in the grocery store, people will come up, are you the guy who writes that column for the paper? You know, <laughs> so it's a funny thing. So write for the newspapers. That's, that's, my, that's my advice to you. Any, anybody else um, want to share what you might be thinking about? I mean, you're not committed to anything. I'm just kind of curious as to what issue you might be thinking about if you're going to write a paper. My uh, my research is about ancient Greek stoicism. So I don't know yet what uh, connection, but I, I like so much about the subject to Socrates, justice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I don't know. I'm thinking about punishment. Yeah, Stoic stoicism about uh, stoicism uh, uh, about the the concept of oikiosis. It's the fundamental ethic of stoicism. Grotius Grotius used this concept uh, about the justice, about the, the concept of. Uh, uh, a sympathy, yeah, uh, the concept of cosmopolitanism is about justice and stoicism. <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah. Well, that that's um. I, again, I think that that um, is is a topic worth um, looking into. Um, the, um, you know. Aristotle 
is, is going to talk about um, a, a, a just person. And um, an a just person is an equitable person, um, right? And it's, it's the idea of being an equitable person that um, he actually associates with the, with the idea of forgiveness, that an equitable person will employ forgiveness. Um, and I, I, think, I think most of us would, <laughs> okay, Mo most of us would, would ag agree that a person who is fair-minded about things would be reluctant just to be um, always pushing for a harsh retribution. Um, again, who's the, um, I mean, we have caricatures of people like that. Um, again, we talked about Victor Hugo was yesterday um, in, in Les Miserables, the, the, um, the police um, um, prefect, um, Gervais, is that his name? Yeah, Gervais. Um, is just so dead set on the vengeance of the law, um, and it is very personal, so it is vengeance, that he is not an equitable person. And when he finally realizes that he's not being true to what the law is supposed to be, he kills himself. He kills himself because he can't, how could I be, this was my whole identity and I missed it. I didn't get it. I didn't understand. And he can't live with himself. The, you know, we're talking about the guilt being so great that he can't deal with it anymore. So, so it's a question about um, being an equitable person, what the role of forgiveness is, and how that might fit into a notion of um, an idea about um, punishment. You know, um, and it, 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 that's an interesting question to ask about what the role of punishment, sh or the role of forgiveness should be on the part of people as individuals in our, again, in the second personal realm, as opposed to what forgiveness might be in the legal realm. When we talk about forgiveness um, as pardon, mm -hmm. as um, mercy, as mitigation of punishment, things like that. So those are. Yeah, okay, those are good. Good things. Anybody else want to? Please. Yeah. Uh, can I return to the issue of forgiveness? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I read your uh, chapter about yeah. forgiveness and. Uh, I became uh, a little, uh, how to say, uh, concerned or interested, but the point is, it made me more questions and problems than I had before. Okay. So this okay. is good. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, Fair enough. The paper, uh, uh, I, I think the idea is very interesting, the, that uh, the idea of that, that your idea in this chapter and the other uh, papers you, you suggested to us to read about forgiveness and, and restorative justice, I think, mm -hmm. I think very interesting and, and made, me, made me think a lot. Uh, and uh, made me think about that question as I, I made uh, before, that mm -hmm. uh, okay. in, my, uh, in my opinion, let, let me say, uh, when I made the comparison between the Hobbesian and the human and the uh, Lokian, uh, this is in part something I'm, I'm thinking about because I was more Lokian before, and I think okay. the correct approach is yours that I classify as uh, human and Hobbesian. And this kind of, I accept your point about justice is complex. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. But uh, uh, this is a a way to simplify the discussion and, and maybe... Uh, but uh, now about forgiveness. Uh, the point is the relationship between forgiveness and supererogatory actions. This is what I, uh, uh, I was thinking about in, in reading your chapter. Uh, because you usually say uh, forgiveness is not something that is required in a sense of ob obligation. People are not 
uh, we don't have a duty to forgive, uh, but forgiveness is something that we admire, uh, that we say that we say that people that forgive. We, uh, we we sometimes admire it. There can be situations that arise where people forgive, and we don't understand. And I can tell you, I'll tell you about one of those after you get done. But uh, yeah. So I, I was thinking yeah. maybe appropriate forgiveness or forgiveness uh, when we forgive something uh, in an appropriate circumstance. Uh, if there, if this exists, so uh, there is a kind of uh, act of forgiveness that is uh, required in a uh, no strong, no stronger sense. Uh, uh, this is quite similar to supererogatory actions. Uh, for okay. example, supererogatory actions are uh, not obliged, uh, people are not obliged to be supererogatory, but right, right, right. Uh, they are required in a sense. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they are, if they are, uh, if supererogatory actions occur in appropriate circumstances, we uh, say that people are good. Mm -hmm. uh, and okay, but uh, forgiveness is uh, something we expect in a normal, let's say normal circumstance, let's say ordinary circumstance. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we, 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 we expect that people forgive others uh, in, in restorative justice, for example. They are quite ordinary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but supererogatory, no. Supererogatory actions are quite extraordinary uh, yeah. actions. So there is a the similarity between them. And uh, uh, in the point is, uh, but let's resume the idea. Yeah, you, yeah, I, 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 uh, um, uh, 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 I, impl I imply it from your text that first, forgiveness is related to rectifying justice. Okay, mm -hmm. the, uh, there is a relationship between the act of forgive right. and to rectify uh, injustice. Uh, but forgiveness is not obligatory. People don't have any duty to forgive. But forgiveness is not supererogatory too because they are quite ordinary mm -hmm. and not super ordinary or uh, extra extraordinary. Uh, but we admire people you said something about that, but we usually admire people that can forgive, that uh, forgive. Uh, so, uh, it's quite mysterious for me now, uh, <laughs> the, the place of forgiveness in uh, normativity, in ethical normativity. Uh, the, and it's more mysterious than supererogatory actions, in yeah. the sense. You understand that? Uh, because, uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, they are not something uh, extraordinary, because supererogatory actions, the heroic, for example, Urbson's paper t told us about the heroic actions. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what I, uh, uh, I'm calling a, uh, an extraordinary action. Uh, this is something we don't expect people are usually or ordinarily able to do. So this is this is a reason why we don't require from them to be supererogatory. But uh, in forgiveness is different because we expect that um, all people, uh, uh, independently of their capabilities or virtues, that they can forgive. All uh, anybody can forgive. Uh, so it's not extraordinary. But it's not required, it's not, uh, uh, what, what do you say about that? <laughs> yeah, well, um, oh, there are situations that come up where forgiveness comes in as a topic, and um, you know, the forgiveness that a person offers has got to be directed at um, an offense that a person experiences. So that if, um, if you, you murder my wife, right, um, 
I can't really say I forgive you for that and mean anything by that statement other than the pain that you have caused me is something that I will forgive you for. But I'm not forgiving you for the act of killing my wife because she's the only one who could do that and she's not here to do that. You gotta live with that, okay? So you're, you're not, if you do something like that, you're gonna carry that guilt with you. But I could very easily wind up um, just a wretched person because of what you did. You know, and people will tell you that if you forgive people who wrong you, it, it winds up having psychologically beneficial effects. Um, if, if something were to happen where I got around to forgiving you, you know, for the killing of my wife, what I would be saying about that is I'm forgiving you for the pain that you have caused me, okay, um, in, in that. And I think people, um, we, we have to be clear about what's being forgiven and who's being for, forgiving. Now the reason I interrupted you there, and I apologize for doing that, but um, there was an example of um, forgiveness that came from a religious community in Pennsylvania several years ago. Um, they were an Amish community. It's a Protestant religious group that um, um, they've got um, uh, livelihood habits that go back to pre-electricity. Um, they ride around in horses and carriages on the roads and um, they, they live in community without um, telephones. There are different orders and some of them are a little more modern than others, but they really do harken back, they're farming people. They make great furniture, they you know, have house raisings and barn raisings and they're agricultural people. Um, they have very sophisticated religious society, all of that. Well, there was a, um, an Amish school in southern Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia where a gunman went in there and killed, I don't remember the number, but like 23 children there. And within a day or two, the Amish community came out. I think the gunman was killed, but they, I'm trying to remember that piece of it right now. But anyways, they came out, this I do know, and said they forgave him for doing that. And um, that was very hard for people in the immediate wake of that horrible thing with all of these children dead to, to understand and appreciate. Now, they're a Christian group and they have a very, um, um, what conservative, literal interpretation of scripture, they understand that forgiveness is a Christian duty and they followed that duty and forgave this gunman for killing all of these innocent children. And um, there were people who just thought this was horrible, that they would do that. And at least they would say, I don't understand that. And Christian people would say, I don't understand that. And I think part of the problem there is the thing that we were just talking about. Who has standing to offer another person forgiveness? Um, now the family members of these murdered children could say, I'm going to forgive you for the pain that you are causing me at the loss of my child. And if we investigate that and think about that for a few minutes, we could say, I believe in heaven. My child is dead. My child is in heaven. So, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but it's not so bad. My, it was an awful thing that happened, but my child is in heaven. Um, so my child is with the Lord. That's what we were all doing here anyways. So it's a, it's a positive Result and maybe that takes the sting out of it, but if they were forgiving um, th this this gunman for for murdering the children, it's like the children would have to be the ones who offered that forgiveness. the The parents can um, can uh, you know forgive the pain that's being caused them, right? Um, but um, can, can they, you know, and I think that's when you start to take the situation apart, that's what it's like. Have you ever heard of the book, the, um, um, was it The Sunflower? 
the, the, the Simon Wiesenthal story um, about the Nazi soldier who's um, dying and asks a, um, a, a, a Jew who is serving in the hospital to forgive him for his participation in the killing of Jews. And he tells the, he tells Wiesenthal um, this story about um, um, participating in, in the killing of Jews, and he wants Wiesenthal to forgive him on behalf of all the Jews that he killed and that have been killed. And the question comes about what standing does Wiesenthal have, Simon Wiesenthal, to forgive him for what he has done to other people? Only those other people could do that. So I, th I think when you start to take these situations apart, um, it's not really an act of super irrigation that you're talking about. It's, um, it might look like that. Um, uh, be, it's beyond a duty, but it may be that it's not even appropriate to be thinking of, of, about that. Is, is not, yeah, some, yeah, some. Yes, right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think people, I think there were a lot of people who thought that what was going on there was, was perhaps um, super erogatory, but I think there were other people who were thinking, this is not, this really isn't reasonable. And there's something that doesn't conform even to a Christian understanding of this. But that's, that's tricky because the, um, the ethical standard, you know, Jesus was not an ethical philosopher. He was not a moral philosopher. And the statements we have from Jesus in the gospels about his teaching um, don't easily add up to a, a moral philosophy, okay? They, they are certainly moral guidelines, but um, you know, if Jesus tells you to go sell all you have and give everything to the poor, um, there are very few Christians who do that, very few, um, if any. So how can Christians get away with not doing what Jesus said? Um, so, um, but he, Jesus said, for, you know, forgive. If somebody slaps you, you um, turn the other cheek. Um, that is a response um, to that, and it, it does mean that you should carry forgiveness in your heart. You should be prepared to forgive people who, um, um, pro who harm you or, or harm you with an, an offense. But you have to keep in mind that a lot of times when we receive a harm, it is in the grand scheme of things a rather minor thing, and we have a tendency to make them big things. Having a proclivity, an inclination, a, um, uh, an attitude where we're ready to forgive means that we don't allow minor things to become major things. And sometimes when the major things happen, it takes us um, a good long time to work up to forgiveness um, for somebody who's caused us um, a harm. So, um, um, I don't know, how, how does, I don't, we, you know, forgiveness is a topic that is relevant to the idea of punishment. And, um, you know, the, the, the question is, um, is forgiveness, you know, we talk about a person being, we talk about the end of punishment being restoration, restorative justice being, restored back into community, um, does that necessarily mean that the person who has received the offense has actually forgiven the offender? Can you be restored back into community? And can the process of restorative justice bring you back into the community without the person who has been offended actually saying, 
um, um, we are now in a situation of forgiveness. Um, one of the articles you read talked about the difference between forgiving and forgiveness, that forgiveness is a state um, and forgiving is an action that you are prepared to do. You can have a forgiving attitude and um, it, is, it is sort of an action, but um, forgiving attitudes and, and it does, does not necessarily bring you to the state of forgiveness. Now, maybe that was, a, again, kind of a difficult article to, I forget which one that was. Um, if that, that might have been a Darwell piece, actually, as I'm thinking about it right now. But, um, you know, the question sort of on the table, can you have restorative justice achieving the end of reintegrating an offender into the moral community um, without the victim actually granting um, forgiveness? I don't know the answer to that. So um, do any of you have a thought about it? Or? Anybody? You know, the, the upset in the relationship between a, an offender and a victim um, can be restored in the sense that um, um, restitution can be made and restitution can include more than just, um, you know, I've got a $20 injury and you repay me $20. It could be that you um, provide certain kinds of services for me uh, or, or, yeah, I mean, the restorative justice thing can talk about all kinds of, of um, um, possible actions, uh, but, uh, but can those things go on without the person, um, the victim, uh, experiencing or, or offering to the offender forgiveness? Can you withhold forgiveness and achieve the ends of restorative justice? That would be a way to put it. Anybody, any thoughts about that? Just kind of thinking out loud here. <laughs> please, please. Uh, but if the person don't forgive the victim. If the person don't forgive the victim, yes, the balance didn't happen. Social justice, justice. So it's necessary to forgive the victim because uh, there is a difference between uh, forgiveness for social justice and for personal. Okay, yeah. I understand that. I, that's a good point to raise. Um, the the thought I'm having in response to that is that if if um, you are the victim and I'm the offender, okay, and we have this imbalance, can you, without offering me forgiveness for what I did, can you um, engage in a restorative effort um, for whatever reason? Okay, we, let's not go there right now. But you, let's just say you're willing to do this. And it may be just self-interest. Maybe you know that um, um, if we can get this balance put back right, um, you're just going to be in a better place in your life. But you still harbor resentment over what I did, right? Um, so if I, um, and I as the offender come to you and say, in this process, I have been made aware of how hard this is for you and how much I have hurt you, and I apologize. I am deeply sorry for what I have done. And I go through that part of the process. Is that enough 
to say that restorative justice has been accomplished, even if you say, okay, I, I appreciate hearing that, I wanted to hear that, and um, it's relieving some of my issues. It's like we were just saying with the burden of disgrace that the rape victim has, um, by my confessing and my apologizing and my bringing to my encounter with you an awareness that I am a wrongdoer and I did something wrong, is that enough to affect the restorative justice project, even if you don't go the extra step and say, well, I forgive you. You can't do that for some reason. Do we have restorative justice there? That's my question. What do you, th what do you think? Do you, do you think that's enough? <laughs> well, uh, I work many years in a social program okay. Okay, here in Brazil. And I, I use it, the restorative program, face-to-face okay. uh, -face victims and offenders. Okay. Uh, uh, talk about feelings, yes. about what or why he or she did what he or she did. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, not always the victim forgiven. But okay. yeah, for me that was uh, perfect when the offender uh, had a conscience about what he or she did was wrong and uh, hurt feelings about the, mm. the, the victims. Okay. Yeah, for me, in practical issue, yes, it was enough okay. sometimes. Yeah, that, ma that makes sense to me as I'm thinking about it. That makes sense to me that um, um, forgiveness is um, an extraordinary step to take and um, not necessarily super erogatory um, be, be, because, you know, if a person knows that I am apologetic and that I'm sincere, it takes some of the emotional sting away from um, the victim, okay? Um, if they know that I am sincerely um, sorry, that I have done this, and I recognize that it was a moral violation that took place. Um, it seems to me that the um, restorative justice piece is in play, and that a person is coming back into the moral community. And that's what the, you know, the Hampton article is talking about too, that the moral education piece of punishment has been achieved and affected if, in fact, I am willing to recognize my moral wrongdoing. Um, she has a couple of steps in there that, that she, um, he, I don't know, Jean is the name, so um, uh, I should find my notes on this. But, but in, in any event, um, that if, if punishment um, is effective, it is, um, it is educating the person into an awareness of a moral wrong that's being done, and a, the moral community is uh, communicating that um, in, in a, well, in, in this case, it would be in a restorative justice context, where if you're the mediator, you are facilitating the conversation so that this can be, be effective and keep, keep things on track with that. So that, that, makes, um, that makes sense to me. I think that's an interesting thing to think about. And, and there's a question of time, too. Because sometimes after mm -hmm. the victim uh, apolo uh, uh, apologizes the, the offender yeah. out of that moment yeah. after. Yeah. There, there are different times to offender in that moment yeah. say that, yeah, I'm wrong. And the victim, uh, in that moment, could apologize or forgive the offender. But after time, sometimes the victim uh, forgiven it, but in right. another 
time, not that time, yeah. when they were face to face. Yeah, and, and the idea of a person showing remorse, going through the communicative act of apologizing, which is showing awareness of a, a moral wrong being committed against you, the victim, um, it seems to me that that would naturally um, lower the energy level of, of the person feeling resentment. In other words, it would be working on that reactive attitude of resentment and, and um, lessening it and lessening it. And as time goes on, maybe the person really does get to a point where they, they, they kind of let it go. Um, but I, part of this for me is just trying to figure out um, uh, about the offender and um, without receiving forgiveness, are you really back in the moral community? And I'm thinking right now that, yeah, yes, Sim, yes, you, you're, you're back in. Um, this is what we wanted from you and that's what the punishment was designed to do and you're there. Um, there is more to come it's not a perfect restoration. Um, it's not a perfect restoration, but it is, it is restoration and you're back in the community. So that seems to me to be relevant here for that. Are there other re reactions or? Yeah, please. I'm going to talk about the paper I am okay, sure. thinking about. Yeah. I wrote, then I will read it, so I am more can express myself clearly. Neuroscience in relation to ethics. That's the, uh, the scratch of the type. Uh, draft, the draft of the type. Neuroscience in relation to ethics. O or not ethics, but with relation to natural law theory. I think that's bad. Okay. How social pain and pleasure can exert psychological influence on ethical and unethical behavior. Is oxytocin hormone as important to moral in the role of, of trust as authors of such as Paul Zak has stated? Is the uh, Last question is the most important, I think, of the, the paper. Is the natural law theory of punishment compatible with recent discoveries about human social mind? Human social mind. Mind? Social mind. Huh. What do you, what do you mean by that? What are, what are the recent discoveries in... Okay, okay. Uh, one of the discoveries was made for, uh, by Lieberman in 2003. He discovered that pain, physical pain, okay. has the same, has acti activates the same area that social pain, social pain does. Okay. And that was a breakthrough. The, the doctors was, were impressed with that. They, they never thought that one, one feel that you would use to treat uh, physical pain would relieve hmm. a social pain. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is something I'm yeah. thinking about huh. uh, in my research, <laughs> and it's not related to ethics. My my research right. is okay. not mainly related to ethics, <laughs> but I I'm trying to build a bridge between those. Well, that, that's very interesting, um, and, and, and part of your question was what natural law might be, uh, how that might be relevant, is that right? That, it, that, yeah, so you're, with that kind of a question, you're also asking how natural law, um, ethics or something, might be relevant to, to that, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, that, I think that's very, very interesting because, um, um, Natural law does want us to um, um, understand nature, 
okay? I, I, seriously, it, it, it wants us to take seriously the idea that we have a nature as human beings. Um, and we can't assume that um, even though, you know, Thomas Aquinas in the 14th century was writing about natural law and had a view of human nature, and it basically said we're sinners or something like that, you know, um, um, that the, the idea of what it means to be human, what it means to be a person, um, is still relevant to discoveries that can be made about persons, okay? Um, so if you find out that there are correspondences to be made between um, our neurological um, systems, which are part of our nature as we have bodies, that's part of our nature, right? Um, our neur neurological systems um, are connected to um, our ability to feel both physical pain and social pain, if you will. Um, it seems to me that that's kind of interesting, that um, you're, you're discovering something about our nature as human beings and, um, and when I say nature, I think what that means is that this crosses the boundaries. This becomes something kind of universal, that um, we, uh, we have things in common as a result of being human. And our bodies are um, uh, um, pretty much the same. So if this discovery is made in a clinic in New York City, and there's evidence for it, and they want to claim it as a scientific truth about what it means to be human, it should um, um, be applicable in Sao Paulo and, and in um, Beijing and you know anywhere. It's about our nature. So um, I would think that there is some room to, um, to evaluate some moral thinking around those, those kinds of things. Um, where you want to go with that, I, you know, um, um, I, you'll have to figure that out. I, but I, I do think that in virtue of the fact that you're discovering something or bringing up a discovery about um, how we are constituted and put together as human beings, um, that's relevant to, to moral thinking, okay? I mean, the example I was using um, yesterday or the day before is, you know, if we have discovered something about um, how it is that people become um, attracted sexually to persons of the same sex. Um, if that is something about our nature, um, that some people are heterosexual, some people are homosexual, that um, that could affect how we evaluate the moral meaning of heterosexuality and homosexuality. Rather than having a homosexual, um, uh, a heterosexual majority say that homosexuals are bad or evil, if it is part of our nature, what you have to say is that it is part of our nature to be sexual persons, okay? And some of us are heterosexual, some of us are homosexual. It, you know, you, you wind up doing things like that with it. So the claim that a person is, um, um, I, we were talking about perverse and defying their nature because we're assuming everybody is heterosexual by nature. What if that prep proposition is not true? What if that's not true about our nature? Our nature is that we are sexual persons, okay, but it can express itself different ways. That becomes relevant to moral evaluation. So um, that one I've thought about. The thing you're doing, I don't know where you go with that and, and, and what you're going to do with it, but I think that's very interesting um, that um, there's a certain kind of neurological evidence that um, um, says that we are beings, we are as human beings uh, capable of experiencing pain and we do this neurologically in a physical sense but we also experience pain in a social sense and um, there's you know there's evidence that the same part of the brain is dealing with both kinds of pain there are different kinds of pain but 
we are beings, human beings, that experience pain. And what is the, what is the meaning of that for, for ethics? And um, natural law, I think, wants to pay attention to that kind of stuff, I think. So as somebody who works in that, I'm, I'm interested in that. I'd like to know more about that. So have at it. <laughs> so sounds interesting. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Criticism, ideas, anything that you're thinking about that can help me in my paper because it, it's very, it's a draft, it's not, I'm, I'm not done with, uh, with the goal of the paper yet, mm -hmm. there is just initial questions. Yeah. So please. What I was talking about was the relation between uh, the pain of being rejected, the pain of ostracism, and that this pain has the same, you know, activates the same area, the cingulate, the dorsal, this, uh, the cingulate cortex, anterior dorsal. It's, it's close to the, the corpo callosum. And this area plays uh, a role in, in, our, in our behavior, and in our ethical behavior and in our unethical behavior. That's my theory. And do you have any idea how can I uh, present this, uh, this discovery in a ethical field, in, in the natural law theory of punishment? Is there, it's, it, is, is it possible? Do you think that is a nice idea or that it doesn't make any sense? The question is for me. <laughs> You're the doctor. No, I, I can't. I can't. I can't answer to you because I, I, I'm not neurologist. Uh, or, uh, but I, I, of course, I think you can. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, several other uh, people uh, in neuroscientists, uh, neuroethics, neuroethics. Uh, I think they have done something in this. Direction, probably, uh, but your uh, but your question is about natural law, yeah. But natural law theory. But what is what's the point uh, exactly? <laughs> the point is to to look into natural theory and. See if it's compatible. If 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 it has room for natural science to to help or to relate to this theory, if there is room to that, or if it because it's very old theory and maybe it can't relate. And the natural law it's just a name and not. Uh, something really into the theory. I'm not sure about that either. And that I, I want to, to see if it's plausible if, 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 or if it ain't possible. Um, 
not sure. Uh, Lloyd, you know you know the work of uh, Joshua Green. No. Joshua Green, uh, psychologist and uh, philosopher. Uh, his last book is called Moral Tribes. Oh, Moral I, I, Tribes. I've heard of that book. Yeah. Uh, Joshua Green argues that uh, our common sense morality uh, is uh, is connected with our emotions. And uh, he says that uh, yeah, this is quite uh, curious concerning the traditional deontological theories like Kant, for example, that says that uh, deontology is a matter of use of rational capacities. And uh, Green sustains and uses uh, some rich, uh, fine f findings in neuroscientific yeah. studies showing something in the direction of uh, uh, he, oh, Daniel, a, Daniel, uh, Daniel says that he's a utilitarian. Uh, huh? He's utilitarian. Yes, yes, of course. But uh, yeah. the, the idea, but the, the idea, yeah. the idea of Joshua Green is interesting because uh, what he says is that the ontology is quite primitive. Uh, or, or the ontology, uh, uh, or the ontology, the common sense morality that is the ontological retributive punishment, for example, is the ontological in this uh, quite uh, simplified uh, version. Hmm. And uh, and the point of uh, Joshua Green is that uh, what uh, in our brain it is our emotion, uh, emotion, yeah. emotional. Uh, abilities or capabilities that uh, triggers, uh, for example, our rejection to violence, or rejection to murder, or rejection to uh, injustice in general, resentment and anger, etc., are related to our emotions. Yeah. And uh, and so uh, he sustained. He argued that uh, utilitarian uh, 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 reasoning. Uh, is different because it, 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 it requires from us to uh, understand better the circumstance, to balance the circumstance and you use our rational capacities and, and in our brain. Right, right. It is in different yeah. uh, parts of the brain. Functionally, they are different uh, uh, dispositions. To react to the uh, in a deontological way is more primitive. So, uh, uh, he, ha he has an uh, a commentary very uh, curious about Kant and Nietzsche. Uh, he says, uh, he quotes Nietzsche saying that uh, uh, Kant talked, uh, defended or, uh, the, 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 the peasants, the morality of the peasants uh, for, the, uh, <laughs> for the intellectuals, for the, right. the learned people. Uh, because the, the ontology is the morality of the peasant, the common sense morality. This, uh, uh, emotional trigger and uh, not like utilitarian calculation that is not emotionally triggered but is uh, in a quite detached way uh, mm -hmm. triggered by you. Uh, the, so this, uh, the conclusion of uh, uh, Joshua Green is that uh, our common sense morality was evolved uh, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a biological uh, uh, sense for uh, solving problems of our relationships that were problems uh, of our uh, 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 of our existence in communities and tribes, uh, uh, and now uh, this 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 poses uh, several predicaments to us because what we need is another another kind of morality, and our brain is not. Uh, build it to permit this kind of morality, more utilitarian. And, and so uh, he argues that we need to change. And other people like Julius Avulescu and Ingmar Persson in Unfit for the Future argue that we need moral enhancement. We need more what? Uh, moral enhancement. We need uh, to change our biology by medications or even by uh, genetics because we need to be uh, post humans uh, to, 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 to deal with the predicaments of our uh, future, our near future, because our brains, like Daniel says, 
uh, is pre uh, primitive, too primitive for that. Um, uh, I, I think, of course, you can develop a theory about uh, this. I several ideas about that. I don't know if uh, this is uh, sound, but uh, yeah. uh, I, I wrote I, I wrote a paper that is published in Journal of Medicine Philosophy. Uh, uh, it's called The Misfortunes of Moral Enhancement. And it, it's, it's a, a criticism of this idea, uh, saying that we can be more optimistic than what they said. They, they are too pessimistic. Uh, Julius Sabolesky and Ingrid Persa are, are very pessimistic. They say terrorism, for example, will uh, over, uh, overflow or will, uh, and, and for example, the uh, natural environment will be uh, uh, more uh, damaged by our common sense morality. Uh, 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 Joshua Green calls, uh, uh, and they call, no, Joshua Green that calls this the tragedy of common sense morality. But uh, the idea is the same in Julian Savulescu and Mer Mer person. They think, they think that our common sense morality, that is the ontological, that is right based, uh, uh, this kind of morality put us in a very serious predicament. We need to change that. We need to be more welfareist. That is, Julius Sabulescu and Werbund, we need more welfareist, more altruist. And uh, 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 Joshua Green says we need more explicitly, more utilitarian. Uh, and I, 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 I argue that they, they, they go too far. Uh, we think, I, I, I'm more optimistic. I think education, and, and, and I think our, 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 our present morality, or morality that is the ontological, right-based, uh, is, is a remedy. It's quite, uh, it's quite, it's good enough to, 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 to deal with the pre these predicaments, but, but the discussion is, is under, <laughs> is, is going on. I don't, I don't think how you could uh, design an experiment or a, but, but, but I think it's this in Joshua Green uh, has some uh, literature to, 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 uh, for you. Just, uh, this is kind of a small thought and it, it was just sparked by, by something you said. Um, uh, again, the focus of what you're doing is on the idea of pain in two different dimensions, right? Um, pain experienced as um, physical sensation and pain as a social sensation, right? And um, um, because of all the connections that get tied, there could be possibly um, something that natural law would be interested in around the idea of connecting both of those things to um, emotions and maybe to reactive attitudes. Because um, keep in mind that um, um, emotions, um, as we've been talking about them, we haven't really done a um, kind of a theory of emotion thing here, but um, emotion, emotions are, um, you know, they have targets. Emotion, an emotion has a target, you know, a bear comes in here, I feel fear, you know, there's a target to it. And emotions can be rational, they can be irrational. Um, a student walks in the door and I, it's an irrational emotion. A bear comes in, um, it's a rational emotion. And we, we talk about it like that. And um, see, emotion, emotions, um, we often think about them as feelings. But, and, and they can be accompanied by feelings. I would not deny that by any stretch. But emotions have a cognitive core. This is the kind of thing Martha Nussbaum writes about and a lot of people who do this kind of work. They have a cognitive core which is um, which becomes a, a, a mode of communication, interpretation, um, evaluation. You know, when I say I love you, you know, to somebody, what I'm saying is I have a field of objects in front of, in front of me. They're people. And I am evaluating you because I love you as being more significant in my life than any of the other objects in my perceptual field. Now that is a pretty crass way of talking about love, but that's what it is. It's a cognitive um, 
event going on. So that, you know, brain and all that is being um, involved in an emotion, which I understand the emotion, and if you hooked me up to a galvanic skin response thing, you'd, you'd get my heart beating and my sweat going and uh, respiration increased, and, um, which would also happen if the bear came through the door. Um, but, there, I mean, there's a, there's a physiological response going on um, to this emotion, and I'm just wondering if, um, as you think through this problem, is there some way to attach it to, um, to emotions? What is it that causes um, um, pain physiologically? Um, is, is it, um, um, it's something that hurts me, and we want to say something that hurts me is not good, so we have seem to have opened some kind of a doorway to something ethical right there. And if we talk about um, feeling social pain, that um, somebody has lied to me and I have a reactive attitude and I feel resentment, there's an emotional thing. I'm wondering if there's some kind of a, some kind of a connector in emotions to the kind of issue that you're raising. Because if there is, um, emotions themselves make reference to cognition and to interpretation and to perception, these cognitive activities. And all of those things, I think, are ultimately related to our natures. They're related to ethics. Um, there's something going on. And I mean, this is not my project, so I'm not, I don't know if this is helpful to you or not, but um, there might be something in the idea of, um, of emotions being a non-discursive, non-linguistically um, explicit way of understanding and communicating that might be relevant to something like that. You know, oh, I, I know what a pain is, and if you lie to me, I know what the hurt of that is. The question is, what is the connection between them, and does it have something to do with natural law? Does it have to do with ethics and all that? And I would think it has something to do with um, cognitive procedures that um, I want to avoid that um, in the future. I learn from that. There are cognitive things that go on as a result of a physical sensation of pain. Um, the mistake would be to think that the physical sensation is in some way comparable to um, the experience I have when you lie to me and I have a reactive attitude of resentment. The sensation, the, the, there, there's got to be something beneath that, I think, for ethics to get involved in. And I wonder if that would be in the emotion. We talk about moral emotions. We talk about rational emotions and irrational emotions. And that language makes sense to us, if you think about it. Um, and with the love example, that, that's, you see all that stuff come into play. Um, you see the evaluation, the, um, the, the attributing of value to my beloved, you know. Um, and giving that, um, one, that's one of the things love is, it is giving more attention and more evaluative um, weight to this person than to that person. Right? And that's how that emotion works. So I don't know, I, um, I think it's, um, it's an interesting question you've raised. And, um, you know, have at it, see what you can do with it. Um, but um, that's, I, I would, I'm just kind of thinking out loud too, so I don't know. Other, um, um, any of the rest of you want to share anything about a paper you might be thinking about, or do you want to? We've got a few minutes. I told you I'd let you out a little early today because I kept you long yesterday. Um, but are there other things related to the idea of forgiveness or um, to apology? or um, to some of these other uh, emotional things. Um, you know, because remember we, we put up the, the stuff that first day, we had that whole category at the end of the board there about emotions and remorse and 
forgiveness and all that. And this has been kind of our day to, to spend a little more time on that. I don't know how well we've done with that, but um, we have tried to get into that a little bit. Are there other thoughts you have or are any of you thinking about writing about um, punishment and what role forgiveness could play in that? Uh, I am studying now moral luck. Oh, okay. Uh, and I want to know your opinion about uh, punishment and moral luck case and sometimes blame, because moral blame and legal blame, and if, how can we treat and respond to cases like that? Like, uh, in your nine criteria of your mm -hmm. punishment, yeah. you, you yeah. said that you have taken into account the background of the, mm -hmm. of the yes. people. So I think it's gonna, uh, in this line, well, let, let me ask you, do you think that um, moral luck should play a role in how we evaluate the wrongdoing of an offender? Yeah, I, I'm a defender okay. Okay. of moral luck in... Okay, in, so we're in agreement on that. Um, so then it's a question of degree and... Um, uh, because um, background does matter. Um, and there is, there are determinants for our, that's the language used, determinants. There are things that do, do help determine our behavior from, um, from the, char the characters we have. I mean, this goes back to Aristotle too, that our, you know, if you are raised by a family of um, criminals, you know, this is again your Godfather movie thing. If you um, if you're raised in those values, um, uh, you learn to um, protect the family um, through means that are not socially acceptable. Now, all of us would want to protect our family, but, but there can be, um, so we could, you know, if somebody from the Godfather movie is put on trial, you know, from the, from the story, um, we could say this is a person who really suffered some bad luck in in terms of how they were raised and the values that they received and we do, do we really want to hold this person so responsible that they feel the full brunt of the law it's a tricky question because it may be they could be so far out of um, our moral norms that the idea of educating them back in from their defect or their deficiency could be a really difficult kind of educational process, but it might be one really necessary for things like protecting society or something. Yeah, this, this seems to be a constitutive moral luck. The luck that you have when you bring, when you are bring it up, uh, when you are a child, the education, but I don't know if you are familiar with the other kinds of moral luck. For example, resultant luck, that is a case of uh, Thomas Nagel, that the reckless driver, that there the is- rec the, the reckless driver? Direct, uh, reckless driver. Uh, there is two reckless drivers, just one, uh, the, the both drink and drive, but just one drink, drive, and kill some pedestrian. So this is a case of bad luck and it's outside of the control of the agents and how do you think we should punish this this driver equal punishment or or no? well um th there was an article by the lawyer um Weinrob, i think is his name who who deals with um this in in your collection of things um because he wanted to look at um um, homicide, um, gosh, do I have that handy? Um, he has those, um, yeah, he has at the end of the article these different, um, um, the, the fault of the victim, let me find them real quick. It, one is the, um, um, 
the innocent aggressor of the felony murder and negligent homicide was uh, the thing that he brought up. And I'm sorry, the name of the article? Uh, th this is um, uh, Weinreb, W-E-I-N-R-E-B, and the article was Desert, Punishment, and Criminal Responsibility. And this guy's a professor at um, Harvard Law School, or was, he may be retired now, or he may have even passed on for all I know. Um, uh, but he, he actually deals with these, these issues because he's wanting to know if um, um, what additional responsibility falls on you if you go to, well, he, an interesting example he gives is um, uh, a minor altercation, a minor altercation. You know, you and I, we just kind of push one another. Turns out you're a hemophiliac. And the slightest kind of intrusion into your, um, the integrity of your skin um, starts you to bleed and you wind up bleeding to death. Is that death on me? The altercation was minor, would have never gotten to a court kind of thing, but now you're dead. Um, you know, and he's raising these questions about um, what can happen with, res with respect to criminal responsibility. It's a question really about responsibility and how, how much should you be um, held responsible for, th for things. You know, you rob a bank, felony murder is you rob a bank and somebody gets killed in commission of it. Um, um, how are we to hold you accountable if in fact you were gonna rob the bank you had no intention of hurting anybody, and and maybe the death that takes place is a heart attack that somebody has or something. Are you are you responsible for that death? Uh, you know, and one of the things he he talks about is the the intrusion of dangerousness. That's kind of an ugly word, but um, if you're creating a situation that heightens the danger, it winds up making these um, situations. Um, understandable because um, we do we do hold people responsible if they get involved in a situation where they're doing something wrong and then an unforeseen and unintended wrong that's even worse happens like somebody dies um, are you responsible for that so he he gets into those those kinds of issues and it, it's 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 complicated and I, I this is a I asked you to read this article, but I didn't talk about it because I, I find it difficult. Um, his, his discussion of utilitarianism and um, um, uh, especially at the end, I, boy, there were sentences in there I read 15 times and I, I, I just had trouble the with it. The article is deserved punishment and? Um, but, it, but, but questions about, um, you know, he wants to talk about a, a normative natural order that provides a context for our evaluations of, um, of wrongdoing that goes beyond what a person intended. You don't intend, uh, you're, you're going to do something wrong and you intend to do it, but there are other wrongs that follow because what you're doing is dangerous. Um, and the question is how responsible are you for that? And uh, there, there is a question of moral law um, at, at issue in, in some of those situations. And uh, you're, you're raising the Thomas Nagel thing, and um, you know what is the answer to that? Um, um, I, I think our ordinary moral judgment. This is what I think he says too: is that the the person who winds up killing um, the person should be held responsible in a much more serious way than the person who doesn't. But he's raising the issue in this thing about whether that's really right. And I think he winds up, I, I think he winds up saying that you have to take that on. It may not make a lot of sense because your intention wasn't there. You had no foresight that this was gonna happen. You're innocent of that death. You had nothing to do with it. On the other, other hand, you did have something to do with it because you created a situation. You know, and we do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Any other questions?
No, thank you. Well, no, that's good for you. That's, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. But you might want to take a look at that article and, and, and see what kind of, um, it, it, it was probably in your reading list somewhere. It was one of the things that I sent down. Okay, good, okay, good. Well, I'm firm for you. Time's up. <laughs> Time's up. And I didn't let you out five minutes I would like early. to thank the audience, but especially I would like to thank you, Professor Lloyd Stafford. Sure. My pleasure. Uh, My to pleasure. teach us this great seminar on moral obligation and punishment. Okay. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Your presence at Atkinson is an all support. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh,